Okay, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. You're uh, a wonderful audience. On, on behalf of SACNAS and Mayas, I welcome you to this wonderful conference. You're a very beautiful audience. Not just the women, okay? <laughs> but the men too. You're, you're beautiful because you look like familia, okay? You're beautiful because you look like me, okay? <laughs> But don't worry, um, you don't look, you don't, don't worry, you don't look too much like me, okay? <laughs> okay. So I want to uh, push a couple of buttons here and see what comes up. So I want to let you know that next month there's a, a conference for mathematicians. It's a beautiful, wonderful conference that was started by Carlos Castillo Chavez. It's called the Blackwell Tapia Conference. And uh, look on the webpage, any of you in mathematics who would like to attend this. Uh, it's a thing. Next year, in uh, April, we have another conference. It's called, this is for people in computing, computing sciences. It's a wonderful, it's, it's directed at undergraduates. It's called the Richard Tapia Celebration of Diversity in Computing. So th those are the, the two commercials. Now, who am I? Who am I? Okay. There's a title of this. This is the talk. Now, notice that science, technology, and diversity for a sustainable future. The uh, title of my topic is global excellence, global excellence. So let's follow that. Who am I? <laughs> okay. Okay. That's who I am, okay? That's who I am, 57 Chevy, okay? <laughs> now, I'm a Chicano mathematician and, and um, my mother came from Mexico to Los Angeles at the age of 11, entrusted with the care of her 10-year-old sister. They came alone. My father came from Mexico with his two older brothers at the age of seven. My parents were the hardest working people I have ever known. Okay. They told me that they came to the United States in search of education for themselves and hopefully for future children. Times were tough. They had to um, support themselves they were not able to uh, graduate from high school. However, their educational dreams were fulfilled through their children. Out of five of us, four have undergraduate degrees. Three of us have graduate degrees, albeit two of us are lawyers. Okay? <laughs> my, my father taught the value of inclusion. He loved everyone, and everyone loved him. My teachers, my mother's teachers are right here. My mother's teaching pride. Pride in being Mexican, pride in being who you are. As I grew up in Los Angeles, she knew that was in conflict with local laws, local rules, okay? Belief that you can, and as we heard earlier, si se puede. Work habits, and the one I'm introducing here is global excellence. Not good for the neighborhood, not good for the block, but global across a global scale, okay? So global excellence was a big thing with my mother, okay? So what I'd like to do right now is give you an example of how her teaching in global excellence sort of influenced my twin brother Bobby and I. So you're gonna see a little bit about my twin brother and Bobby, okay? Now that beautiful, wonderful, handsome person, that's me, okay? 19, 1957, okay? Now that wonderful, gorgeous woman, that's my wife. She's over there, okay? 1957. <laughs> So we built, decided to take the engine out of that 57 Chevy because it was a national champion and build a dragster. So here we go. We built in the backyard. We all got in there. We had a lot of fun. We, we couldn't afford a trailer, so we put it in the back of a truck. Okay? <laughs> we went. Now, in 1959 with that car, we got a very famous match race against the green, uh, uh, it was against the green monster from Akron, Ohio. So our little Chevy against the green monster. And uh, my dr brother Bobby was the driver. So there we go, we beat the green monster. I wouldn't show you the pictures if we hadn't won. And um, so Bobby kept on. And from the little Chevy, we went to Chrysler's and stuff. And Bobby became world class. He set the Long Beach, which Long Beach Strip was the most famous by far, lads here. And Bobby set the strip record. That's a picture of Bobby on this side. That's Bobby. Then Bobby in February of 1968 set the world record, okay? So that February of 68 was the world record. And that is exactly what uh, we saw at the time and didn't realize it was really my mother's teaching. Okay? My story. 
I attended below average high school here in Los Angeles, and because of my teachers and counselors, they did not encourage me to go to college, even though I was very good in mathematics. So I went to work at a muffler factory. When a coworker insisted that I go to college, he said, every day during the summer, go to college, go to college. Okay, 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 I'll go to college, okay? So I went to community college. When it came time to transfer, two of my math professors strongly directed me towards UCLA. Little did I know how crucial to my career that advice would be. Very similar to things we just heard a, a minute ago. As an undergraduate there, I saw other students with less mathematical talent, but they were going to graduate school. And I said to them, you're not good enough to go to graduate school, okay? <laughs> okay. And they said, well, we're going. Then I said, well, then maybe I should go too, huh? <laughs> and I did. That's called peer evaluation. So, <laughs> so after receiving my PhD, I was guided by David Sanchez, member of SOCNAS. SOCNAS got a hold of me. Tapia, what are you doing? I don't know. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Boom, okay? And I went to Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, which for me was the best place in the world mathematically and everything. It was wonderful, okay? From Wisconsin, I went to Rice. That was more than 40 years ago. So the major players in my uh, path have been my mother, my coworker Jim, my math and chemistry uh, community college professors, and UCLA math professor David Sanchez. Without their strong uh, guidance at the appropriate time, I would not be here. I wouldn't have had a PhD. So timely mentoring guidance at the appropriate time were important ingredients in my success with the beliefs that my mother gave me. Other people wouldn't believe them, but I said, I know I do, okay? So um, we're going to go, that went the wrong way. Okay, here, okay, well, yeah, the conference theme. At, at this point in history, the United States is at a crossroads in the wake of oil spills, global warming, greenhouse gases, many scientific issues. We must emphasize sustainability in our research. The nation, the country, the world, it's a critical issue. However, what I'm gonna talk about is more of a critical need to emphasize sustainability in our workforce, in our national workforce. You have to come become an active part of our national workforce. You are the nation's largest gathering of minority scientists. We've heard that several times, okay? Will we, the Hispanics and Native Americans, be the future engineers and scientists of the world, of the nation? Will we be the dominant force? So uh, how are we doing? Well, I mean, we're looking good here, but how are we doing if we leave, okay? Hispanics in the academic pipeline. Study this. This data came from Donna Nelson, a good friend of mine who's here, I know, and um, she has a wonderful report of how we're doing. You don't have to read all of it. The yellow things. This is the top 100 departments in the country representation of faculty. In mathematics, we Hispanics are 1.7% and yet we're 15% of the population. In computer science, we're 1.8. In physics, we're 1.8 and we're 15%. We're not there. We're not there. Okay, Asians on the other one. Asians in computer science are 30% of the faculty, 4.4% of the population, 30% of the faculty in electrical engineering, 30% of the mechanical engineering. Okay, so we're not there. Now what do we do well? Educational attainment in the state of Texas by race and ethnicity. That less than high school means, what's the percentage of Latinos, that's the big blue line in Texas, who don't go to high school? It's over 50%. So we win not going to high school, okay? <laughs> okay. How about who wins going to high school but no further? That's the yellow line, that's the blacks. The blacks win that one. Who wins going to high school and a little bit of college? The whites, okay? Who wins college and more and more? The Asians, over 50%, okay? So are you surprised? Not really, <laughs> okay, okay. So look at the, uh, so these are the projections of the population. 2010, look at the, the black population is 12.2 right now. And in 40 years, it's gonna go down. So the black population is going down. The Hispanic population, 16%. In 40 years, it'll be double, over 32%. So we're really moving fast, okay? Now here's an attempt to explain this. 
see, on, on, as you look into uh, these things, the red is going to be Hispanics, but I'm not going to talk about it. Talk to the little box on the green. Non-Hispanic Americans, for every death, there's a birth. You die, you're born. It's kind of like, I think, a three-dog night song. I think, I think okay. okay. <laughs> But what about the red box? How about the Hispanics? Okay, for every death, there's eight births. For every death, there's eight births. Okay. So how do you explain it? Well, you know, we're warm-blooded, we're romantic. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 We're Catholic, but the truth is. <laughs> But the truth is that we are a young population. The green population is an old population. They're not going to have birds. We are, OK? <laughs> so Native American data is worse, OK? So I, I didn't even show it, OK? Um, <laughs> so here's some thoughts to, pon to ponder. So I want you to think about these things. I just wrote them down. OK. So we just saw that the faculty shortfall across the universities in this country is non-domestic Asians. I don't care. White men, too. White men, too. OK? It's not just, oh, the white men are doing well, and we're not. It's domestics. The faculty long fall is foreign Asians, foreigners, OK? Um, STEM minority student asks, will I be taught by someone who looks like me? The answer is probably not, OK? One of my students said, I took eight math classes at UCLA, and just one of the eight I was taught by a domestic professor, let alone a minority, OK? Now, this is not picking on UCLA. It could not matter what school I put in there, OK, pretty much, OK? Um, the underrepresented minority's worst enemy is poor preparation at all levels. It starts, and we heard statements by the chancellor a little minute ago, don't be afraid to close the gap and catch up. OK, race and ethnicity should not dictate educational destiny, but it does. We can predict how far you're going to go because you give me a race and ethnicity that is not right. Underrepresentation endangers the health of the nation, not the health of the discipline. When people tell you we need you because math is unhealthy or computer science is unhealthy, no. The disciplines are healthy. Math will continue to be healthy without women and minorities. It's going to be fine. It's the nation that's not going to be healthy without you, okay? So you're not going there to save math. You're going to save the country. The browning of the populations. OK, so now we're going to talk about um, the browning of the populations of California, Texas, and the nation. Um, national concerns, representation issues. As a nation becomes brown, will our workforce also become brown? If it does. As we get a brown workforce, must quality suffer. As brown comes up, will quality go down? Okay. From the uh, Austin American Statesman two days ago. Headlines. For the first time in the history of Texas, the freshman class at the University of Texas is less than 50% white. Less than 50% white. First time in the history. Next thing. In this time of changing demographics, red in this time of becoming brown, <laughs> okay, can UT continue without compromising its excellence? And the article ends this way. It says, concluding statement, clearly future classes will continue to reflect the state's growing Hispanic population. This is a good thing because Texas cannot compete in a global economy without the talent, skills, and resources of all Hispanic Texans. It made the right statement at the end, OK? <laughs> and then letters to the editor. We're browning because it's all those damn Mexicans that are coming across the border, OK? <laughs> immigration is 40% of the new immigration in the country in Texas. Latino immigration is 40%. OK? Asian immigration is right at 40. It's over 35. So you see the Asians are coming in at the same rate we are, which is just an awareness point, OK? Now, I want to hit you with a point here that is a bit 
difficult, but I want you to share this. I want to share this with you. I've been writing a lot on that, and next week I'll be in Washington and I'll speak about this. True diversity doesn't come from abroad, okay? So the point here is that affirmative action initiatives began in the late 1960s and early 1970s as a way to solve broad, deep, race-based problems in American society. But because these were controversial and challenged in the courts, the court shifted away to something called diversity. Affirmative action dead, diversity lives. This shift towards broad inclusiveness has played to an established strength of academe. Universities can recruit the best students and faculty members from all over the world, but say that they're doing it in the name of diversity. Okay, now we're doing the right thing. When I expressed concern to colleagues about the extreme low representation on our campus of minority graduate students and faculty members, the answer I get run along the lines, but we have a woman from Buenos Aires, and we have three Chinese students, and a Russian, and a postdoc from Nigeria. My colleagues believe that they're working towards diversity, and in a little sense they are. When I point out that domestic underrepresentation is the critical problem, they reply, well, Richard, when considering diversity, we simply have to go with the best, and the best is the foreign minority. Many international students are admitted to graduate school in the United States because they are highly competitive in the best students of their nations, often the product of early academic tracking. They've had strong educational foundations, intense specialized study. They are stronger candidates for admission than all but the very best American students. In the STEM field, underrepresented minorities not only have to key, compete with the best in America, but the best in the world. Okay? That makes it very hard. That means we have to be aware and we have to go for it. Correcting the underrepresentation of minority groups then has little to do with international programs. It has little to do with the presence of foreign scholars, even those who are black, brown, or speak Spanish. It has little to do, and these don't solve the problems of universities' lack of success with Mexican American, Native Americans, Puerto Rican, and black youth from across the United States. The students who come in help us. I'm not opposed to foreign students, but to have to make a choice to do that as opposed to educate the youth, the minority youth of this country, is what's happening. Are there bright spots? Of course. Our featured scientists. We have four featured scientists. We have Hector Carrasco, who is uh, essentially representing Mayas. And he, good. And, and look at, look at, um, at Hector Carrasco's credits on there. I'll let you look at those. And he, you know, this is a, a, a really positive thing. There's Hector on the picture. Well, we have Carletta Chief, represents Saklas. And there are the credits for Carletta. And look how much fun she is having, okay? Now, don't you want to go work with Carletta Chief on those things? Look how much fun it is, okay? Irene Rico, okay, <laughs> representing Mayas. And here's her credits. Now, Miguel Mora representing SACNAS, okay? <laughs> Professor Moras from AM. He's done great things. He's a legend in Texas. Look at all the good things he does. How would you like to go on a trip with him too, okay? University of Texas, bright spot. Most universities, high research tier one schools are five to seven percent underrepresented minority in mathematics. University of Texas is 30 percent. It leads the nation. Why? Because it was such a wise faculty? No, because the legislators in the state of Texas, the minority, minority legislators, enacted a thing called the Texas Top 10% Rule. Top 10% of your high school, you're automatically into any public school you want. Now, th so there's two things. In Texas, high schools are de facto segregated. So 10% means 10% of black, brown, whatever. Also, the University of Texas, in lack of wisdom, built UT Austin and the Seven Dwarfs, okay? So everybody goes to UT, okay? The Rice Department of Ma Computational Applied Mathematics, that's where uh, I am. Now, if we go back and look at this, we just got an award from the American Math Society for the department in the country that makes a difference. In uh, 20 years, we've had 35 underrepresented minority PhDs. We continue to win. One year, the NSF told us that there were eight in the country and we had produced four. Many of them are here. I will not ask them to stand up, but many of them here. We probably have 25 to 30 here in this audience, okay? Okay, 
Reflections. Ingredients for success. Talent, sure. Passion. Preparation and work habits. And all measured by global um, excellence. Danger. When I see students, see, I have a class that I taught last year that had 12 people and 11 were Chinese. Okay? This year I have 25, and the Chinese and the Indians are only half. Okay? So I have a, a layer. If I look and see what's the danger with a domestic student, maybe not enough passion, poor preparation, giving less than 100%, and cutting corners. You can't cut corners. Now I want to show you something here. This is um, another example of global standards. This is the Tapia Chevelle called Heavy Metal, wins Top Paint Award here in Pomona. The most prestigious car show in the country, in the world, is the Pomona National Roadster Show. In 2005, we debuted this car at the Pomona National Roadster Show. That's our car, that's Gene's car, and that's my car, okay? 1970 Chevelle Malibu SS. Now, there's a monster. Those of you that know a lot, that monster has taken off uh, Iron Maiden's Eddie. I just took it off the web and kind of had a, a Chicano artist in Houston change it. We want to win the paint award. This is the national paint award. This is not just, oh, paint it, oh, that's neat. This is national competition. Had another Chicano student draw me some graphics. This is Joseph Cifuentes. Here's the trick. Here's the trick. This is what I want to share with you. See, when you, th the car is black with orange graphics. Most people would paint the car black and they put the graphics on top. But graphics and candy require 25, 30 coats of clear. So you get a, a, a lip, you get a ridge. And the judge runs his finger and he says, no. So what we did, something very clever there, everybody is copying us. We painted the whole car graphics and candy first, and then we did what's called negative masking, and then came back with the black. Mulholland Drive. Okay. Okay, so here's my challenge to you. Okay. Um, here is my challenge to you. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay, so so basically, I need I need to find my challenge to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's my challenge to you. Okay. There's no doubt that we Hispanics are essentially extremely caring, beautiful, wonderful, and creative individuals. We are. We are. I just showed you with the car. Okay. We need you in the scientific workforce, including the fac uh, on the faculties of universities. We're not there. We're not there at all, OK? If we're to become leaders, we must be present at the places where leaders are selected. We must speak for ourselves and guide our people. We know ourselves best. Often when I was on the National Science Board, somebody would say to me, we're going to have uh, minority education, and let's have that part. I said, we can do it ourselves. Let us do it. We know ourselves, OK? You cannot, OK. You cannot wait for, uh, for critical mass, minority leaders, role models. We need you now. You have to move now, OK? Now, here's a personal share that I want to leave you with. This is a personal share, OK? As you, this is, this is, I'm helping you on a situation that I had to de deal with. As you move through these tasks of life, do not expect the balance of good and bad or success and adversity to be uniformly distributed across the population. The statement, I have had my bad, now comes my good, is at the very best wishful thinking. My wife, Jean, and I were married while I was a sophomore at UCLA. She had just graduated from high school. Okay. Okay. Our daughter, Cersei, was born when I was a, a junior at UCLA. Okay. Since we were young parents, the three of us grew up together. Gene's passion was dance and mine was math. Gene danced in various Hollywood shows when with several companies. Okay. Cersei acquired a passion for dance and academics. I received a PhD from UCLA that same year, and then the same year that our son was born, our son Richard. The four of us went off to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and then to Rice University in Houston to, to conquer the world, to conquer the world. We had more than our share. Uh, 
we had more than our share of successes in Houston. That's Gene, that's me, that's 57 Chevy. Um, <laughs> Gene had a very successful dance studio. I received tenure in record time. Cersei was a dance and academic star and danced with the company in New York before returning to Houston to study at Rice. In 1977, Gene was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and in 1975 with my, uh, myasthenia graphis. She had to give up her dance, give up her studio, and navigate life from a wheelchair. Um, this is at the State Department in Washington, and Jean's there, and she's here too, okay? There she is following the car in the, in the, in the wheelchair. Now, three years after Jean's uh, my, my senior gravis of multiple sclerosis, Cersei was killed in an automobile accident, okay? Jean said that these were three strikes for her, and she was out. Her life is over. Finally, I convinced her that she still had much to contribute. She started an exercise program for people in wheelchairs called Coming Back. It was so successful, she got on national TV. Our daughter, Becky, came into our life at this time, setting the mood for the comeback. Okay. Um, I was the first Hispanic elected to the National Academy of Engineering. I was appointed to the National Science Board uh, by President Clinton. I was appointed to the position of university professor at Rice University, only the fifth person to be so honored in the history of the school. Both Jean and I would trade these awards and honors, and she would suffer multiple sclerosis a hundred times over to have Cersei back. But that's not our choice. Our only choice is to give up or play the hand that we were dealt. The choice is, our only choice is to give up or play the hand that we were dealt. The choice is not easy. Life has its strange twist. I'm now a world expert on things that I really never wanted to know anything about, like traveling with wheelchairs, okay? and how to travel with a person in other countries in wheelchairs. I share this personal story to tell you this. When you encounter obstacles and adversity in your life and as you go forward, learn to look both ways. Your challenge is to handle adversity. Prosperity is quite easy to handle. Remember that some failure is a part of every successful person's life. True success is not the education that you have, but what you do with this education. It's not the hand that you're dealt, because you don't have another choice. It's how you play it. At each stage of your life and career, continue to dream and to make your dreams come true, but learn to cope and still enjoy life if they don't come true. Funny life, all the people around you today are beautiful, reach for them. They need you and you need them. Thank you and please accept these challenges. That's it.